Hi, uh, hello, thank you. Um, thank you for joining us in our uh, conversation this afternoon. Uh, my name is Su Wei. I'm a uh, Beijing, Be uh, Beijing and Hong Kong based uh, art critic and curator. Uh, today we are going to talk about mapping time, <coughs> mapping time and space um, in terms of you know, analyzing the relations of art and politics or art and political crises in different cultural contexts. So this discussion actually derived from the the emergency somehow in, in the local Hong Kong context somehow. I mean, given the fact that the political uh, circumstances in Hong Kong has been radically changed since several years and there are a lot of appeal for political rights and also a lot of discussions in, in local uh, community about how art or how intellectual practice engaged uh, with uh, the discussion of politics. So I think uh, we have three uh, artists here from different, very different uh, geopolitical contexts. And today we are going to talk about geography and history. We are going to talk about how art practice is engaged or responds to or negotiates with the uh, 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 certain ideological and political uh, circumstances in their practice. <coughs> But also, uh, we are also going to talk about how art is inevitably entangled with the discussion of politics and how the shadow of politics uh, influence our practice in uh, different cases. So um, I think all these three artists, Tiffany Chun, uh, Morgan Wong, and Akatrini Gigisini, sorry, I already pronounced names not in the right, in the wrong way. So um, they all share a kind, of, a certain of parallel in their practice, and s all of them, uh, in their practice, all of them tries to appropriate uh, different, uh, let's say, diverse uh, uh, images, uh, abandoned images, or materials of abandoned histories or archives to recreate a kind of uh, reimagination of history of 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 the relations between art a creative creative practice and and social practice so i think we will start building on this we will also talk about the um the very uh, character of art uh in confrontation or in negotiation with the community and tiffany Morgan and uh, Akaterini, they have uh, uh, experienced in Hong Kong, in Vietnam, in Greek, a different a rapid, a rapid economic and political changes. And they will also share with us about their, uh, their witness and how they respond to this context. So a, a, a bit uh, background uh, of, of, of us, of me and the three artists. Uh, Morgan, Morgan Wong, he completes, completes MFA at Slate School of Fine Arts, University College London, and his recent solo exhibition includes uh, Untitled Expressway, Rolls Royce Motor Car Showroom in Hong Kong 2015, and Fitting Down a Street Bar Until a Needle is Made in Tin Tyne, uh, Type Gallery, London, right? And his work has been presented in ZKM, uh, Made in Made Museum, Kashua, and in the 8th Shenzhen Sculpture Biennial, and also uh, in and his current exhibition is now happening in, it's taking place in Seoul Bubble at Seoul Museum of Art. So in recent years, Wang has gained uh, critical attention for his provocative works across a broad range of media, best known for his duration of performances, intricate installations and videos. Wang holds a long-standing interest in connecting elements of temporality and materiality. And Tiffany, Tiffany is a Vietnam, Vietnam and US based uh, artist. She's noted for her cartographic drawings, sculptures and videos, photographs and theater performances that examine conflict, migration, displacement, urban progresses and transformation in relation to history and cultural memory. She's based in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and she's one of the region's most uh, respected and internationally uh, active, active contemporary artist uh, uh, in Vietnam. 
and her work was recently uh, featured in the Venice by Binali in 2015 with an installation of 40 map-based drawings relating to the ongoing crisis in Syria. So she was awarded in, uh, in 2013 Sharjah Biennial Prize honoring her exceptional contribution to the Biennial. So she has, she has been present in four solo shows in, in the US and participated in some museum shows including California Pacific Triennial, Orange, Con uh, Can Orange Country Museum of Art, and San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And also Trin is a co-founder of Sun Art, right? An independent artist initiated nonprofit gallery space reading room in Ho Chi Minh City. And Ekaterini, uh, born in 17, uh, 1976, uh, she lives, in, <laughs> lives and works uh, between the UK and Greece. And her work uh, explores how image operating within the global media uh, environment that shapes the conscious and unconsciousness in different cultural contexts. So in 2015, she was one of the exhibiting, exhibiting artists at the Armenian Pavilion uh, in Venice Pinali, which received the Golden Line for Best National uh, Participation. In 2014, uh, she completed her, uh, her PhD at the University of Westminster, London, and was a visiting scholar artist at the University of Pennsylvania in US. So I think uh, we should uh, start to talk about making time space um, <laughs> with example of, of Morgan Wong's practice, I think. So Morgan, um, all will start with me. Yeah, yeah because yeah, yeah. The, the image yeah. is there. Yeah, um, Shu Wei asked us to start talking about the, the <laughs> yes, I, I started, about the, the, the way we approach uh, the geographies and histories in our practice by talking about specifically about uh, our, our, our way of working. So for this, uh, I chose to talk to, to you about the, the work I did. I mean, I'm pointing there because I'm looking at this. I chose to talk about the work that I presented in Venice, which was um, in the Armenian Pavilion. Ah, in the Armenian Pavilion, which was a, came out of very specific practice of collecting material, compiling an archive, uh, collecting you can say documentary material or historical material and compiling an archive. I focused on photographic albums and uh, tourist catalogs from producing the 60s, 70s and early 80s from Greece, Turkey and what was then po uh, Soviet Armenia. And uh, this uh, was a process of uh, collecting material through flea markets and archive and uh, secondhand bookshops over a period of four years uh, I was interested in a very specific practice of uh, archiving, creating a, a collection that was incomplete, that was outside official narratives and, archi and, and archival practices, and um, reworking this material in, and creating a new narrative. I will, Morgan, I will leave. I can tell you more about that uh, as we so talk. Please in loop, so. <laughs> Um, uh, Morgan, one quick, quick question. Uh, actually. Okay, right, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> let's wrap the time. <laughs> in case we get lost. Yeah, as time is actually an essential element of your yeah. practice, actually. So, we also talk about your, uh, your project is always research based, and somehow I would describe as an ellipsic, ellipsic uh, 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 way of approach. And I think uh, from the very early practice, it, which you realize in London and then in Hong Kong, you have conceptualized objects in your work and try to ex uh, express a certain sense of transnationality or transnational, uh, transnational progression in your work. So maybe you could elaborate uh, on that and then talk about more about your recent uh, project in, in, in uh, throughout your career in, uh, in Seoul. Um, so I have to maybe in general talk a bit of my practice um, as Su Wei um, have introduced. So basically my, um, I'm very interested in the research of time um, in general, but I, now I see my practice have been going into two mainstream, um, which one is the um, 
a more micro way of uh, uh, seeing time, which is um, by using uh, my own perception of time through performance and um, through other mediums. And then um, it grows into my own personal perception in time and how I understand um, time changes in a human scale. And on the other side of um, a more macro way of seeing time, so it come across like um, research of history and also research of policies as well, um, which affect in a more um, uh, bigger scale in a way. And um, so this comes into um, what you have seen in the image um, uh, at the slides, because um, at here I think we, um, three of us are kind of um, relating to more of the research and also in relating to social political context as well. And um, as Su Wei introduced um, my latest project in Seoul um, at Gikuja Art Space, um, actually, I I was actually told by a friend um, uh, f like few months ago that um, North Korea have actually changed the time zone um, to try to distance themselves from the colonial history um, because it's not written. I mean, it's not. Um, um, I was not saw. Um, from the news. So I was actually thinking, is this just another false announcement of the North Korea again? So, um, and also it, it comes with to, um, of the thinking of the constitution of the power of speech as well. And so I go into my research in um, whether it, it is true or not. And in the end, I find out that um, in some foreign medias, actually they have a uh, report about this event. But at the same time, even though the foreign media have reported about that, that yeah, you never can confirm if it is true. Um, so from that, I started to think about actually who constitute time, especially who constitute time difference, and also time difference um, as an immaterial border, um, which is a growing um, um, interest of my works. Um, especially like last year, I have done a project in Parasite that um, using smell. Um, I would describe it as the border smell in between Hong Kong and China. Um, that is a very particular smell that is um, a collective memory to people or um, to Hong Kong people or to people who have been across that border that whenever you have that smell again, you will immediately thinking that you are actually in that place. So going, uh, quickly going back to the, the Seoul project. So um, actually for the show, I have um, created a fictional time zone um, in the art space, which I call it Gikuja Standard Time, which the short form is also called KST. Uh, yeah, KST. So it's kind of like similar, like a pun um, um, to the Korea Standard Time. And um, so this is how I kind of go into um, thinking of immaterial border um, and kind of like the social political issue of my interest and also time as an issue that kind of come across together. Yeah. Yeah. We can see this. And how about this work? This is a work uh, realized two years before in an art battle, right? Yeah, so this is a work actually um, at Encounter as well, um, two years ago. Yeah. And then um, at, at the time, uh, I mean, this, this work is quite timely as in um, this work actually happened before the umbrella movement um, in Hong Kong. And um, I, w I, was, I was actually trying to create a stage for contemplation um, because I see the art fair which is very busy um, as in it's seemingly like um, the, the situation in the social political situation in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. like waves of uh, political events have been happening. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can see in the work later that um, it's very subtle, very empty, mm -hmm. but you have to really go into the work to see the 50 years calendars that embroidered on the, on the cushions. That is the sole project. Right? Yeah, so this is the sole project. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the wall, um, it's seemingly a white wall, but then actually there have been 50,000 flags that have been peeling off, um, which actually signify a kind of sarcastic surrendering to the political system in a way. Yeah. Okay, let's turn to <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> Tiffany. And Tiffany, um, in your work actually you look through cartography aesthetics to uh, reflect on the relation between uh, aesthetics, power, violence, and social imagination, right? So uh, given the fact that the background of yourself as a refugee actually, mm -hmm. and you have been uh, engaged with the discussion of refugee and this anti-statecraft practice in, in your own work. So maybe you could 
share with us your your methodol methodol methodology of you know bring together aesthetics and you see these drawings aesthetics and uh, the the discussion of refugees well um I, again, um, just like these two artists over here, uh, my work is uh, based heavily in research. Um, in order to come up with a body of work, I would spend years of researching. And by researching, I mean I don't just look over images or like some headlines of something, but I would go as deep as you know all these different archives to dig out all these um, ar archival records that probably um, nobody have ever heard of. And I look through uh, scholars' studies and um, different organizations' reports, you know, Human Rights Watch reports, um, and then also ethnographic research, in which I do field work. I go look for the people who have um, lived through the experience and then speak to them. But in a way, I do my research is I don't go with a list of questions and ask people um, to interview them, but actually I do um, participant observation uh, that I just hang out with them, I go on picnic, I listen to their stories. So everything comes very organically, right? An so immersive, now- Immersive experience. Yeah, so that, that, you know, with all these materials, there's a lot of them. Now, how do I translate that into um, artwork? Right, and then do I need to translate them into artworks to speak of this experience of this certain history of like policies of geopolitics, or I just simply present them as archival documents, right? But for me, it's like you know, like when you question, when you um, going through these archival documents, you also need to question them. So at at what point you realize this is like really reflecting the truth, or whether it just like somebody blah 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 i mean history is written through somebody else's filter right so uh, for that reason you know my remapping um, is actually to bring up that question to question whether to question the subjectivity to uh, question the agenda and whether we can possibly create an absolute cartographic representation of any any place at all and also, one thing I wanted to uh, ask you about is the the visual character of your of your uh, of your works. How come you came up with this idea of you know applying uh, cartography to to represent or or reconstruct the the historical narrative of refugees? Yeah, like with the refugees uh, for the Vietnamese refugees uh, after 1975. At the time, it was like 40 years ago, so there was not a whole lot of infographics available. But if you compare with the current refugee crisis, um, in every article, newspaper article, there's an infographic that shows the numbers of the refugees or the conflict and where the camps are so on and so on. So, you know, when I revisit the Vietnamese refugee history, uh, one of the things that I would have to do would to um, go through all these numbers and figures and statistics and think about vi data visual uh, visualization, like, you know, to come up with a way that um, make it simpler for people to understand and engage because nobody is gonna go through those numbers except for like crazy people like myself or like the two of you. So um, that's how, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but again, another point is, you know, with the Syrian refugee experience is that all of these human lives, whether dead or alive, um, are reduced merely in dots and number. So all these drawings, they kind of a possesses a kind of a power of abstraction in a way, right? So in my understanding, the abstraction is still a, a challenge actually to the real world and as a reconstruction of the real world. And also you put lots of text, text yeah. on the walls and the dots so all, 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 all also have their meanings, right? So this green, red and dot, pink dots. And which make, make in the whole a very spectacular uh, experience actually for, for the audience. Yeah. Um, would you say more thing of, about this spectacular quality of a practice because somehow it, it attracts people to come closer 
to say it. But the, on the other hand, it also challenged people's you know, understanding of aesthetics, you know, in a way. So, I mean, absolutely. I think we, uh, each artist has their own um, strategies, right? I think for me, in order to discuss such horrific memories and experiences, um, I'm not interested in showing it so much in your face. Like, I don't want to splash blood everywhere, and it's just not something that would attract people. So, I mean, according to some uh, curators, my work is a trap. You know, I use beauty as a, as a trap, as a way to attract people, just the same way that probably you use humor or pop culture to attract people into your work. So, yeah, following <laughs> that, Katrina, I think I have a question for you now. <laughs> Because uh, Tiffany has talked about uh, uh, the immersive uh, uh, experience or communication with the communi local community and how she engaged with the with their uh, with their local ex uh, life experience and how how con how she conducts uh, interviews uh, with them. But for you, there's something else. I think, given the background, you, uh, given your family background, you are uh, somehow a mixture, right? A mixture of different nationalities. And also, your, in your work, you also talk about something like, you know, uh, non-inhabiting or non-inhabitation. And you call it a social engineering project. That means that you are somehow uh, engaged with the, the, the very local ideological uh, circumstances. But on the other hand, you kind of uh, uh, applied a guerrilla approach of art, of practice, to, to go beyond go beyond the social content or the social content that the art you practice would, would, would have included? Yeah, in a very simple way, I try because of, uh, it is not available to me, the idea of belonging in one place because I'm a mixture. I come from, also from families of refugees. Uh, I, I tried at least with the work that I presented in Venice to create my own geography, my own uh, space of belonging by bringing together images that uh, signified different geographies and diff different historical moments that are all, all linked with my own biography. So my family comes from the Greek, Turkish, and Armenian territories and backgrounds. But I also, uh, what I was also interested in, 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 in the practice was not only to create this kind of hybrid and transnational space, but also to think of how specific media and visual media, in this case photography, how it was in specific historical moments implicated in the construction of national identities. So I think apart from the humor, uh, the, the, the drawing, drawing in onto popular culture, another uh, element that links my work with uh, Morgan's and Tiffany's is the fact that we are looking at the, the, the way that uh, national identities and national borders and national politics are constructed. Um, I can talk more about that in the sense that uh, uh, photography for me and the photographic album that uh, became uh, very popular in the 60s as a tourist ca catalog or as a tourist guide uh, represents a, a tool for the construction of the image of a nation. And in the work I try to deconstruct that and reconstruct what uh, how, what Suwei calls, through guerrilla tactics, a new transnational space of belonging for myself first. <laughs> I think I want to, I would like to respond to um, what you say earlier about not having just one identity. And it's very interesting because this issue also came up at my other panel at Art Central in which, um, you know, um, there is this notion of, of us artists from Asia that somehow we have to have our national identity attached to our name. You know, but at the same time, if you just say, okay, Tiffany Chung, she was born in Vietnam and now lives and works in Vietnam, simple. This is that really reduced my refugee experience and my transnational experience into just like one place, right? I am not just from, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, I've lived in Japan, I've lived in the US, I've lived through transit camps as a refugee, I've lived in prison. So I mean, um, how do you re reduce that experience into just this one single liner? 
right? It's, it's very difficult. And uh, um, another thing is not even about national borders or territories that, you know, I tap in a lot into my cartographic work, but also this kind of hidden history, right? Because my work is like, I'm really interested in create intervention into um, the national narratives that produce through statecraft. Right, so there's all these hidden history, all these micro history versus the grand history versus this grand national narrative that being put forth by different states. So how do you blur, I mean, how do you bring that back? How do you let people really experience, you know, the history that have, they've never have thought or have heard before? I think that's a really important issue and uh, that probably like you and me brought up a lot in our works and maybe also Morgan. I think it, you brought up a very interesting issue of you know blurring the border, which of course is then present in now you know by the issue of refugees or by the crisis of refugees in Syria and Europe, and actually it this movement, if we call it a movement, actually triggered kind of an imagination of this transnational uh, transnational progression in a way. And also in Ekaterini's work, you call the work a small guide to the invisible seas, right? So seas now, or ocean is now a very, how should I say, a popular, very favorite symbol in art because it's a symbol of death now. But on the other hand, sea is something that connects us. If you think about that, all the cables that makes internet functional, it's lying down the seas. So sea is something we share, sea is something we all have. And, and then this border, or this, this, this existing border, or this existing modernist order of states can be somehow transcend in a way by you know, not only refugees or the social, social changes, but also by the imagination or spiritual imagination of, uh, of uh, let's say, intellectual practice. So. I can talk about this in terms of movement uh, because uh, for me it was it's, it's important that you have movement in time and space. So there is uh, there is the borders, but in the way that I collage um, material from different historical and geographical positions together, I, I address the idea of of movement through time and a movement across space. And I was drawing to the idea of this of the sea. Because I wasn't thinking, obviously, at the time of the Syrian refugees or of the kind of or the or, or of the crisis, I was thinking more of the connection. The, what you said about being connected, the sea has this type of uh, is a, is synchronous. There is a kind of synchronicity and there is connection. So, in my narrative, in my retelling of uh, this new topography, because the, it is a, a, to, a story of uh, seven seas, the seven seas coexist together at the, uh, synchron at the same time and the same place. So they're all mixed. And the, so, so I try to avoid, in that sense, the idea of, of creating a hierarchy or a linear narrative. I want things to exist simultaneously and to be able to move from one to the other. So in response to the to the sea issues, like I also think about I I, on, I not only think about sea as like um, how we usually see it as I mean giving a notion of the sea, but also it's kind of like my practice that kind of using sea or using other ways um, I mean using other matters as an as a um, imaginative um, narrative which kind of challenging with the, the grand history or the micro history. So to continue, um, I was thinking about, so actually I use C as an element in one of my work as well, which is not shown in the slide. Um, but then from my research about um, urban planning in Hong Kong, especially the Satellite Town project, which is actually started from um, very much based on the Garden City movement in the UK in the early um, 20th century, then um, I find out that actually one of the new towns that have been um, um, developed by the colonial government, actually um, for sure they, they are not new at all. They actually bear um, prehistoric history. But interestingly also there is a myth that um, there is a Buddha called Teacup Buddha. Actually he traveled across the ocean and then to come to um, the new town um, and then to bless the, the new town development. So this is the kind of myth 
in the kind of few hundred years ago. And then from that, I was actually thinking about, so actually who is the teacup Buddha? So is it actually the British, the, the teacup Buddha? But then it's interesting because, because the new town actually has been a failed plan um, in Hong Kong. And then that actually makes me think about, so is it China, the, the teacup Buddha? But at the same time, um, at, at, the, at the moment that I'm showing the work, there have been a lot of um, um, things happening, uh, social political things happening in Hong Kong. And then, um, yeah, actually, um, yeah, as, as you might know, there have been the, the, um, the tourist issue that happened in Hong Kong that connects so much with the border issue between Hong Kong and China. So, yeah, so who, who, who is actually the teacup Buddha? Or, so from actually that myth, then it's kind of having another angle to see the history, yeah, that we are thinking about, yeah, time and space. I think I found out who that is. <laughs> I, yeah, maybe actually the artist is the Tika Buddha. <laughs> well, um, the whole idea of the sea to me is, you know, it's really interesting because um, when you talk about marking territories and borders, how do you mark that? on the water. I mean, remember the 1916 Sites and Pikett's Agreement, right? From which they actually drew that straight line across the Syrian desert to divide the Middle East without any consideration for, you know, the local communities, like different sects, different religions, different groups. And now you're talking about the sea. How do you draw the territories? How do you mark territories? I mean, Borders are quite fictional to begin with. So, you know, when you get to the sea, that's when it becomes so, you know, so problematic. And like, you know, going back to the issues of the refugees, you know, when the refugees took the boat. And then like, they just know, I mean, nowadays maybe the technology is better, but back during the Vietnamese refugee era, people just went with a really unseaworthy boat. And, um, and with nothing, basically, they just start like just sailing out. Mm. And then just let the wind just push them to wherever. And then when you enter international waters, whether that international waters or not, they didn't know. So how do, how do you mark this um, territories? You know? and, and C is so much connect to time as well, like the time zone, which kind of like an imaginary border as well, which happens because of the, um, yeah, kind of like the um, long distance travel over the sea and also over railway as well. And then, um, yeah, like actually one of the, one of the um, island country um, nearby um, Pacific Ocean, they actually changed the time zone. Um, so they, they used to be in the, in the time zone that closer to America. Um, but then because they actually have a heavy trade with um, New Zealand, so they actually change the time zone back into, yeah, closer to New Zealand. So this is really arbitrary of how, and especially if we look into map, like how these zigzag of the, of the time zone kind of happens. Yeah. It's like another, yeah, imaginary border as well. Or, yeah, invisible border yeah, in invisible a way. Border. But border actually is a, a realistic issue in Hong Kong, as we all know. Yeah. And as a, uh, a practitioner from mainland China, I would say this border is now separating us, uh, separating not only the common people but also the art people in a way, because given the fact, given the fact that discussion about the umbrella movement last year was so uh, so radically ignored in China, in mainland China, by such a such a, a, a dynamic. Uh, in, in local Hong Kong, um, which make me think what separates us anyway. It's not a border, you know, between Shenzhen and Hong Kong or between mainland China and Hong Kong, but it may be something about, about the lack of a, a common intellectual foundation between us, or among us in a way. So maybe Morgan, you can t share with us more about your thought on this, on this invisible border and how can we how can we ele uh, develop not, or how can we establish a fun an intellectual foundation for us together, not only Hong Kong, but not only China, but the Chinese world, to, um, to rethink about the national, uh, national separation? 
I was actually asked to um, participate in in uh, in, a, in a conference, and um, it's called Visualizing Chinese Border, and um, yeah, <laughs> well, let's not talk about the, the that particular title first, but from that I was actually thinking about it's not really only the territory and the mentality that actually um, separate us, but even like new t technology that have been already separating us, like. Mainland Chinese mostly use WeChat, and Hong Kong usually use WhatsApp, but Taiwan actually use Line. So actually, from and this, Asia <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean these these kind of technology already kind of having a brand of where do you belong to, like what you said about like branding as like a, a an artist from Saigon or from from Vietnam. But that what's that mean? Yeah, I mean it's so complex that. I I have my experience in in Beijing, so that's why I also use WeChat. Yeah, and I have friends in Taiwan, and then yeah. So I think this is quite interesting of uh, phenomena as well of separating the yeah, not only by by physical border but also by kind of like a mentality as well. Ekaterini, any comments on that? Because you have lived in different regions in yes. you know, around Greece and Armenia. Uh my kind of strategy in terms of thinking of the borders and in strategy in, ter in terms of how I collect material and how I practice is, um, is, is, is to bring out this idea of the inappropriate. I'm interested in bringing uh, together, in thinking comparatively, in thinking in relationship, histories and geographies that are not supposed to be thought in relation to each other. So. The Soviet context is not supposed to be thought in relationship to a Western modernist context. Uh, the Turkish uh, nation building process is not supposed to be thought in relation to the Greek nation building process. I'm interested in this type of uh, inappropriateness, which might be uh, why you call the, the, my practice kind of coming out of a guerrilla tactics. I'm interested in, in, in being inappropriate, in being a kind of uh, uh, naughty. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> but how naughty you are, I mean, <laughs> except the, um, the, uh, <laughs> naughty, Venice, the, the, the project in Venice Biennial. Uh, can you tell me, tell us more about the works, you know, be, besides how, this work? Yes. I, I mean, I was not enough to be the only one that didn't talk about any type of uh, historical uh, trauma because the, the, the Armenian pavilion was uh, coinciding with the 100 years of the Armenian genocide, uh, which is already a contested term. And so there was a kind of, uh, a, at least a context where your work is, was presented that related to a particular type of history of loss and uh, trauma. And I want to avoid talking about uh, what had happened, and I want to look at what what developed the histories and the images that developed after that after the event. So, so the the national images of Greece and Turkey and Armenia that developed after the the, the, the conflict, after after the moment of loss. Uh, so. That was a kind of, uh, in a sense, a political position, not wanting to address the trauma and the loss, and wanting to see how what was created was a sense of construction, and it was a construction that followed similar type of uh, ideological um, uh, lineage, although there is a kind of completely uh, different geographies. And also, I was the only one that addressed this kind of what uh, Tiffany said before, this idea of pop. I was interested in the 60s, a moment of radicalization, a moment where photography became popular, a moment where images were linked to the process of consumption, and I wanted to address that not in order to, produ to, to reveal the consumption and the construction or to produce images to be consumed again, but in order to create this kind of possibility of a new space. So I guess, you know, that's very interesting because uh, when you say, you know, you don't really want to discuss like tra trauma and, um, uh, you know, history, but rather than what have developed from that historical moment, you know, but, and then you uh, resort to popular culture of the 60s, 70s. Um, in my work, I, 
I've done the opposite. So, you know, I started with popular culture because, you know, I was uh, from Los Angeles. Um, I was in that Los Angeles, uh, LA art uh, community when in the late 90s when I was expected to discuss my identity politics all the time. And I'm like, okay, I'm so capable of doing much more than that. So, you know, let me tell you what I can do. So, you know, I turned to popular culture, a lot of animation, comics, and all these different things. And then when I came back to Vietnam in the early 2000s, and I was really excited because it's like nobody talked about the Vietnam War. Right? Nobody cares about it. Everyone, uh, the whole country is moving forward at like a lightning speed. But then soon after, I realized this is crazy. You know, like there is no memories of anything. There is no sense of history, nothing, which I call a politically driven historical amnesia. A and vacuum, that's, actually a vacuum in America. It yeah. is a vacuum. So that's when I decided to go back into history and say, I, can, I could have research on history, I could have made the words um, you know, about this history from anywhere, but especially with the Vietnamese refugee history, I would have to do it from Vietnam, because you need a voice coming from within to encourage the young generation to say, you can't take history lightly. This is something that you have to pay attention, not because we want to dwell in the past and in the painful memories, but we want to learn from it. And we have to come up with ways, you know, and things that decide how we take it from here. So that's very important for me to revisit history in that way. One quick question. What is the, um, let's say, mainstream, mainstream Vietnamese historical narrative that, you know, how, did, how do they deal with the issue of refugees right now? You have talked about, I think, the day before yesterday, about the total, total ignorance. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, um, the Vietnamese so-called boat people, um, that whole exodus history is erased into oblivion. So nobody, I mean, in Vietnam talks about it in a public uh, platform, of course. I mean, people know, but then a the younger generation, they have no clue because uh, that is not included in the national narrative. It's not being discussed or debated, whether on a humanitarian uh, perspective or a political perspective. There's nothing. It's, an, it's like this emptiness, right? This void, this vacuum, this amnesia is so prevalent in Vietnam. So, yeah, does that answer the question? Which actually yeah. shares a similarity with mainland China. What, what, what is happening in mainland China from, you know, from which I come from, I come actually, because this vacuum you, you talk about is actually also characterizes the social life of mainland China because the vacuum can suck into everything except, you know, all, but also can object everything out of it. So the only value that could be fit into this vacuum is economics. The only value was the rapidness of e economics which drives us, you know, towards the future, yeah. And then... In the name of progress. Yeah, which then, you know, leads to another problem of histori his historical narrative that, is, that simplifies the social life only with the value or the standard or the rule of the economics. And then that leads to the, uh, to the current discussion of what is the cultural value of China Anyway, after you know the big wave of consumption of Chinese contemporary art since like t uh, 15 years, what do we do now? How do we participate in this, or how do we negotiate negotiate with this vacuum, the issue of vacuum? So I think we share, maybe you know, in the framework of Asia, we share this the same problematics in a way. And Akatrini. <laughs> I, you are not I, Asian. No, I'm not Asian. I mean, I I deal with uh, not in the I, I talk specifically about the Venice uh, work, but I have dealt in in other projects of mine uh, because I looked a specific type of context geographically, the post-Soviet and the post-Ottoman context, and uh, I'm interested in this uh, idea of the post, and I'm interested in this idea of transition, the transition from one ideological system to another, which is usually translated as a transition from the old to the new. 
And through these moments of transition, there is always histories and, uh, and uh, communities that are obscured, that are hidden, that are reframed, that are re-narrated, re retold. A lot of my practice, which you cannot see here, dealt with this type of post-Soviet moment in, in, uh, in uh, Yerevan, in, in Armenia. And in, in that work, I did address a lot this kind of cultural erasure of, a, of the Soviet context, which was as I was not born or raised in the Soviet uh, context, but I could very clearly see that. So I, I do deal with it, but in, not in a, such a kind of a direct way. Uh, I think I, I deal with it as an outsider, made, mainly. An outsider? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I think we should open up this discussion to the audience. If you have any questions, comments, please. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, I have a friend who was just spending a bunch of time in Idomeni um, in Greece. Um, and, uh, you know, she was a, a volunteer, Chinese-Canadian volunteer, who went and uh, spent time there. And she was there the moment they closed down the border. And then she saw how uh, the refugees then went to the border area seeking to cross. Some people died. And it was uh, rather, rather traumatic. And so I'm coming to Basel just after kind of having a, a, a sort of debriefing meeting with, with her after, after coming back from, from there. And what, in our conversation, um, one of the things that came up was how there's this there's a, the, an extremely strong resistance to any capacity to pass through the borders and this like hardening, this intense hardening of the border um, and really having a struggle to come to grips with this, especially as she sees these refugees who's been going through this very fluid kind of system. Um, and then now that's completely stopped. And there's no hope and no, yeah, so this rigidity of the border has sort of come back into place. And yeah, we were struggling to, to, to kind of conceive of that and deal with that. Um, and I just wondered if, any, if you guys had some comment about, uh, about, about that particular hardening moment that we're entering into. Can I answer? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just thought, okay, it's down my alley. Um, <laughs> I think what happened, what's going on in Europe right now, is completely changing the traditional migration parent, in which the refugees first come to a, the port of first asylum, right? And then from port of first asylum, you just wait there or you've been detained there until further notice. Right, and then if you're lucky or you, you pass the screening policy, screening procedure, and then you uh, gain refugee status, and then you wait for a resettlement offer from the third countries and mainly from the West. Back in the day when the Vietnamese were the Vietnamese refugees, Hong Kong is such an interesting case because the Vietnamese that came here, they never wanted to resettle here. This is part of first asylum. People were in transit. But during, you know, with all the things that Hong Kong had to go through, all the pressure, you know, uh, 1997 Hanover, all those things, Hong Kong ended up absorbing a lot of these people, right? So it totally collapsed that migration pattern. So Hong Kong is also the resettlement countries. Now, fast forward to the present time in Europe, and... I've listened on, the, uh, on TV several um, um, authorities from different governments that talking about this, and they all say the refugees should go back to wherever they come from, go to refugee camps and wait, because that's part of uh, first asylum. So, yeah, on another word, like in another word, Syrians, go back to Middle East, less Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, deal with you. We're not going to deal with you because you're like confusing us here. We're supposed to be the resettlement countries. We're not supposed to be port of first asylum. So don't cross the borders. Don't just run over. Right? I think, I mean, that's, that's my analysis from my studies of asylum policies. Um, and I, 
Yeah, so that's just my opinion. I can talk a bit from the point of view of being Greek and uh, although I don't live in Greece, I live in, in the UK, and but I've ah, uh, uh, but I have seen I have seen the refugees and I know the Greek politics and the way that uh, this crisis functions within the Greek society. So from the point of view of uh, of uh, a Greek citizen, uh, we are caught between uh, inevitable uh, movements of people and. A, and a particular type of colon, colonial policy of the EU. So, I, the border is hardening, but um, and and all the, the refugees that arrive in Greece, they do not want to stay there. It is the same. Uh, uh, we, we 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 hold the same territory as you're mentioning uh, Hong Kong. Nobody wants to stay in Greece. Greece is like bankrupt. Uh, there is a, a lot of political, social problems already existing. It is a so society that is being polarized. Then you have these refugees. There is, a, a, there is a, a, a lot of people that are trying to help, but also there is a, 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 another movement of uh, extreme right wing uh, ar arriving, and it is basically a total disaster. <laughs> from my point of view, and I don't see how any of the policies uh, of the European community ha can help this situation. And there is a, a definite, a definite in a, in unwillingness to think in terms of solidarity or in terms of uh, helping people. I think even like the unwillingness in looking back at history and see what we've learned from the Vietnamese refugee crisis the whole world was going crazy over that for how many years? And what have we learned? Really zero, right? I mean, with, I've been doing a case study on the Danish asylum policies and like all the L87 that just passed recently with 32 or 34 tightenings, they incredibly familiar and exactly what Hong Kong or Southeast Asia had done in the past. So it's very interesting that now they're repeating them but instead of, of have drawn from that experience and say the impact of these constant shifting in policy making had on these, you know, already distressed group of people. And, and again, is what we've talked a lot about in our, in our discussion here, is this kind of idea of the nation and of the, of the border, of how it is continuously kind of, we are supposed to be in a postmodern, in post, 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 whatever position. They, we are advanced technologically, we are advanced, uh, we are in a global world, you know, we are globalized, we, I'm here. And at the same time, we need to guard our borders because we have to protect our wealth. Like, let's build a wall and let's have Mexico pay for it. Yeah. Amazing. But it's like, how do you do that? Trust me, they will do it and they will have to pay for it. And right now, the wall is already 10, 10 meters or 10 something, 10 feet higher. But this is not a political discussion. We have to <laughs> insist on that. And Just don't let me start on. You can sense the dynamics, the, 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 the energy of art, you know, confronting with politics, with order, with border, with every visible or invisible rules. But we are talking here about art, not politics. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> So if there's no further questions, I think we should end up here. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.